Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you, and thank you so much for the excellent <coughs> morning keynote, a great way to start a beautiful day. I first want to say a real uh, thanks to the succinct conference organizers who have handled all of this so beautifully and brought such a diverse and wonderful group of people together. I also wanted to say thanks to my fellow panelists. I'm honored to sit up here with you today. And also, I wanted to acknowledge the under stress leads, Jerry Jacka, Brian Allen, Naomi Tig, and Aaron Wolf, who are going to be leading us through the next three days as we work on our section of socio-environmental systems under stress. So first, a few words on this theme of systems under stress. In reading through the dozens upon dozens of abstracts and papers and other materials that were submitted to this theme, there were three themes that emerged for me as I was looking through these papers that I hope if you join into the conversations around the understressed theme, you might be looking for. And so first, some of the topics that brought us all together into this room. So the papers in these sections obviously deal with social and ecological systems, the bread and butter of SUSINC. But we're also going to see a variety of papers under this theme that bring together cultural uh, systems under stress as well as technical systems under stress. In addition, several of the papers in the under stress theme uh, both treat stressors as drivers of vulnerability. And so thinking about what's the frequency, the magnitude, the duration, and the intensity of the stressor, and how does that influence vulnerability across these systems. But then interestingly, many of the papers are also looking at individual as well as collective stress outcomes as a consequence of vulnerability. A third theme that I saw in the papers was related to possibilities for adaptation around these various stressors within these systems, but also possibilities for destruction. And that's what leads me to the topic that the succinct team so kindly invited me to speak to today. So as Christine noted, my research does indeed focus on hazards and disasters, and especially the social consequences of natural hazards events. And so to begin, I would like to ask all of you in this room, how many of you at some point in your life course have been directly impacted by a disaster? And here I'm speaking a sociological definition of a disaster, and so a disaster as an event concentrated in time and space that affects a large collectivity. So how many of you in here have been directly affected by a disaster? Margaret, do you want to wager a guess of what percent of the room? 15 to 20 percent of the room's hands went up, we think. Last year alone, according to our Federal Emergency Management Agency, in 2017, in only hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, and then the California wildfires, more than 25 million of our fellow Americans, or approximately 8% of our US population was affected in just those disasters. And lest, us, lest we remember, that there were many more mega catastrophes that occurred last year alone, not even to speak of the small scale nuisance level events that also happened. This is what just in one day a CNN news feed looked like. We had fires burning, hurricanes unfolding, the earth shaking as Asia was also flooding and Europe was on fire. <laughs> 
we are living in an era of disaster. And so I'm gonna spend the first part of my time today talking about trend lines related to hazards exposure and loss. And my core argument is that when it comes to disasters, some of the most important trend lines are running exactly in the wrong direction. And it is because of these trends, not because of nature's wrath or fury, as we would often be told, that we are seeing ever more catastrophic disasters. And this is why it is crucial that all of us in this room join together to speak to, to understand, and to act in the face of changing social, technical, cultural, and ecological systems. First trend is related to population growth and exposure. In 1900 in the United States, there were 76 million of us living in this country. Today, in 2018, there are well over 325 million of us here in the US. There are more of us than ever before, and more of us are living in areas at incredible and increasing risk to natural hazards. In fact, today, half of the nation's population now lives in coastal areas subject to sea level rise, hurricanes, tsunamis, flooding, and other kinds of threats. Over 140 million Americans, nearly half of the nation's population, is also located across 42 states that, according to the US, US Geological Survey, could experience a serious earthquake sometime over the next 50 years. Several of our largest cities in this nation, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Houston, Miami, and New York City, are at risk of earthquake, wildfire, hurricane, tsunami, flooding, or nearly all of the above. So the point here is not that there are just more of us, but there are more people who are concentrated in highly hazardous areas. Second trend is related to rising social and economic inequality. We live in a world today where the richest eight people, all of whom are men, hold the same amount of wealth as the poorest 3.6 billion people on this planet. In the United States, the gap between the rich and the poor has been skyrocketing since the 1980s, and today the U.S. has some of the highest income and wealth inequality of any developed nation in the world. Wealth and income are also highly unevenly distributed along racial lines in the United States where the average white households hold somewhere between 18 to 20 times more wealth than the average Latino or black house household. This matters so much when it comes to disasters as we know that low income and other marginalized or segregated populations have the hardest time preparing for, responding to, and recovering from disasters. Consider in Hurricane Katrina alone that low-income African Americans were the least likely to evacuate, have evacuated before the storm made landfall. They were the most likely to experience life threat and to perish in the disaster and also were the least likely to return to the city in the more than decade since that catastrophe. Third trend has to do with land use planning and the built environment. In 1999, Dennis Maletti, also a sociologist, led a team of the nation's hazards and disaster experts to write a book called Disasters by Design. As the title suggests, there is nothing natural about disasters, and instead, disasters often emerge from unsustainable development practices that concentrate built environment in risky areas, allow people to build and or occupy unsafe infrastructure, and do not rely on the strongest building codes and practices to ensure that people remain safe. To make this trend more concrete for all of you, and please pardon the pun, I'd like to draw on some very specific examples regarding how what is happening with our built environment amplifies our hazards risk. And here I'm going to use some figures from my own research on children, disasters, and schools. In this nation, there are 6,444 schools that serve nearly four million children that are located in areas highly vulnerable to flooding. 
In the United States today, there are hundreds of schools scattered across our nation that are built of unreinforced masonry and are located in high seismic areas, like in Washington State near the Cascadia Fault and in Utah along the Wasatch Front. When the ground shakes, these schools will either be badly damaged or will suffer complete collapse. One projection for when the Cascadia Fault ruptures, and it will, rupture. 7,600 children in the Seattle public school systems and surrounding areas will perish if the Cascadia Fault ruptures during the school day. They will die in those school buildings. Throughout the state of Oklahoma, less than half of the schools in that state have storm shelters or safe rooms. And last year, the Oklahoma Building Commission quietly remove the requirement that new schools be built with such safe rooms and storm shelters. That is what we are talking about when we talk about disasters by design. And I beg of you, the next time that you hear a news report that says that a tornado killed a child, I would ask that you question yourself, did that tornado actually kill that child or did lax building code enforcement do the deed? fourth trend is related to our natural environment. We are indeed living in a world that is hotter and drier than ever before, and is also a place that in a cruel, ironic twist, either has too little water or too much water, as evidenced by recent catastrophic droughts, rainfall events, hurricanes, wildfires, and other environmental extremes. Trend lines, all lines, heading in an upward slope population growth in hazardous areas, rising social and economic inequality, increasing infrastructure decay, poor land use planning, and unsustainable development, as well as more natural hazard events in an era of climate change. These issues are not exactly additive, but they do add up to more people than ever before living in harm's way who have less capacity to prepare for disaster and who are more likely to live, work, or go to school in buildings subject to collapse or subject to other forms of environmental damage. These social and economic forces alone would be enough to generate larger disasters yet to come. But when you add in these climate-related changes in an ever more turbulent natural environment, we are in real trouble. And so, more disasters, more vulnerable people in harm's way. But what does this also mean for a research community? We also have more hazards and disaster researchers, both what we call core researchers who've dedicated their lives to studying this, but also situational researchers who become disaster researchers after their communities are oftentimes struck low by these extreme events. And we also have more disaster studies. And as Margaret opened with her remarks this morning, she talked about both progress that we have made as a succinct community, but also challenges that remain. And the third major challenge that Margaret named this morning was related to issues <coughs> around collaboration. How do we, as a community of scholars who may be touching some piece of environmental extremes come together to understand and ultimately to act in the face of these extremes. And this is a question that I've been grappling with for a very long time as a disaster researcher. And so this question of how can we collaborate more effectively as social scientists, but also increasingly in interdisciplinary teams to advance knowledge and ultimately to apply that knowledge to reduce the harm and suffering caused by disaster. And so it's with this that I wanted to share with you today when we think about these multiple systems under stress, a vision for our hazards and disaster research community, which many of you are members of in this room. How we can be more prepared as researchers to carry out extreme events reconnaissance research that is coordinated, comprehensive, coherent, ethical, and scientifically rigorous. And so something we are working on right now in response to some of the challenges that Margaret has been identifying and speaking to for a good period of time is to actually establish new platforms and networks 
for all hazards research to coordinate both the social science community but also the interdisciplinary science and engineering communities who go out to understand these events. And so what this means is that we're establishing new social science and interdisciplinary networks to connect to already existing networks that are available. And so there are already, uh, there's already a geotechnical extreme events reconnaissance network that exists. There's a structural engineering network that exists. There is a public health and medicine network that already exists. And so trying to figure out how to bring together these oftentimes siloed disciplines so we can work together to understand these increasingly complex events. The National Science Foundation has also invested a great deal of funding in the hazards and disaster community to address the fourth challenge that Margaret named this morning related to data archiving, data sharing, and data collection at different scales of granularity, and so also trying to figure out how is these research networks come together, can we use existing facilities and technologies that are available to us. And just as approaches to responding to hazards and disasters are urgently needed, so are new approaches for the research community. And so right now in the hazards and disaster research community, we see five big challenges that are stymieing the advancement of disaster reconnaissance research. And so these include things like a lack of training, identification, and coordination of the myriad researchers who are working in this space in response to technological as well as natural hazard events. We have inadequate guiding research frameworks. Oftentimes in this community, we have a lot of issues with cross-sectional data collection, time scale deviations of when engineers go into the field as opposed to when social science scientists go in and so forth. We also have issues with pre-event interdisciplinary integration and also no widely established mechanism in our community for sharing what it is that we actually find. And so I'm gonna to end today with just a few words about some of the things that we're trying to build in the hazards and disaster community to connect to the socio-ecological synthesis community to respond to some of these challenges that we're seeing in both of our communities. The first is related to training, identifying, and coordinating researchers. When it comes to training researchers, we know that oftentimes in this field where there's a lot of pressure to respond quickly, we need pre-event training to help researchers to understand why we need institutional review board uh, clearance before we go into a disaster field. But there's much more than that. We also need ethics training, cultural competence training, and also training in the history of this field, which is now more than 70 years old. In addition to training researchers in advance, something that we're trying to do through these new platforms is to identify, collect information, and ultimately map researchers. And so we, can, we can't connect the dots if we don't know where people, the dots are, right? And so we're trying to figure out right now how we can identify who's in our social science hazards and disaster community and then use GIS as a tool to map and then to ultimately coordinate researchers in the event of a disaster. And so how are we actually going to identify researchers? And this is something that Dean Hardy has helped us to think through. So one is we started by putting dots on a map for there are over 120 academic hazards and disaster research centers in the United <coughs> States today. So we said that's one starting point is where are the centers of gravity when it comes to this area of research. Then at the Natural Hazard Center, we actually have a database that we've generated over the last four decades that has over 4,000 hazards and disaster researchers around the world. We also have held an annual natural hazards workshop for over 40 years and we have all this data on the people who've attended that workshop. We've thought about doing an open call, asking people to self-identify if they are researchers, and then also doing database searches of publications who's received funded research in this area and so forth. And then once we have all this information to put people on a map, then our plan is to gather additional inf information about theoretical and methodological and empirical areas of expertise. And then after a disaster strikes, 
such as the Napa wildfires, what we could do with this information is we could say, these, this is where all the social scientists are within a particular radius of a disaster. We could also then add different layers into this platform so we could look at researchers by academic discipline. Also, we could do things with other sorts of events like looking within a larger path with a hurricane and looking at people and what their hazard studying experience is, what their disaster phase specialization is. We also could use this platform during real time, during an event as it unfolds. We can integrate through various GIS platforms, put real time weather conditions into the platform. And also before a disaster strikes right now, we're <coughs> building out a variety of layers so that we can also look at the spatial relationship between where are hazards and disaster researchers located in proximity to various forms of environmental risk as well as where are researchers located in relation to the most socially and economically marginalized populations. And also looking at other things like partnerships between where researchers are located and the response and mitigation organizations that respond to these events. And there are a lot of examples of research coordination networks that are currently available that we're currently archiving and doing um, an anal a meta-analysis of various research coordination networks so we can figure out how other groups in other scholarly spaces are doing some of this work. A second big thing that we're trying to do in response to the, uh, the trying to coordinate the research community more appropriately is we're also cataloging various research approaches and uh, developing a series of guiding frameworks for the community. We're trying to use these platforms to also encourage longer term data collection. Right now in the hazards and disaster research field, over 80% of all of the social and behavioral science studies that have been conducted in this field are completed within one year post-event. Some of that has to do with funding, some of it has to do with research fatigue and professional capabilities and so forth, but what we know is that disasters are having a longer tail than ever before as they grow in magnitude and scope, but our studies haven't grown in scale uh, in the same sorts of ways. We're also looking how we can replicate across sites and study a larger range of events. We're also using a science of team science approach so we can engage in some of this pre-event interdisciplinary integration that as Margaret rightly spoke to this morning takes a great deal of time. But we know that oftentimes after a disaster that hazards and disaster reconnaissance teams are oftentimes coming together in the face of these events and are attempting to develop study protocols uh, research de designs and so forth, and there's a real race against the clock as this research occurs in these high intensity situations and circumstances that oftentimes have health and safety concerns that are attached to these studies and other sorts of ethical and other issues. Oh. And a third challenge is that we know that oftentimes Increasingly, funding agencies are requiring that teams that go out after these extreme events be interdisciplinary and fulfill certain requirements that don't always match up with our own training as researchers. And so this is where we're bringing in the science of team science approach, which is a really a relatively new area of study that examines the processes by which scientific teams organize, communicate, and conduct research. And the science of team science is so important for communities like ours because it focuses on both micro-level processes, so how we interact and exchange with one another, what our actual communication patterns are like within the structure of teams, but also what our broader macro structure looks like and whether or not that encourages the kind of coordination and collaboration that places like Succinct have been attempting to build for so very long. And finally, the ultimate goal of these building out these platforms is to figure out how we can best share and convey the information that we are gathering together because as disasters continue, 
to grow in scope and magnitude and frequency and duration and intensity. It is also equally important that our community respond in kind. Thank you so much for your time and attention.